Welcome everyone to our worship today from St Peter's Church, Alworth, as we continue to journey with the persecuted church through the book of Acts in the Bible. Let us pray. God of truth, help us in all that we do to keep your law of love and to prayerfully walk in the way of your wisdom, following Jesus as our Lord and Saviour. In your name we pray. Amen.
Today's Bible reading is taken from the book of Acts, chapter 18, starting to read at verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But when they opposed Paul and became abusive, he shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. Then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Titius Justus, a worshipper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord, and many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptised. One night, the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent, for I am with you and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half, teaching them the word of God. While Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews of Corinth made a united attack on Paul and brought him to the place of judgment. This man, they charged, is persuading the people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. Just as Paul was about to speak, Gallio said to them, If you Jews were making a complaint about some misdemeanour or serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to listen to you. But since it involves questions about words and names and your own law, settle the matter yourselves. I will not be a judge of such things. So he drove them off. Then the crowd there turned on Sosthenes, the synagogue leader, and beat him in front of the proconsul, and Gallio showed no concern whatsoever. This is the word of the Lord. Today we come to the seventh part of our series, Dangerous Faith which is looking at the faith of the persecuted church. I'd like to begin with a true story. Sagar knew as a Christian from a Muslim background living in Iran that holding her secret house church was dangerous. She first encountered Jesus through a dream. He used the same words as he spoke to the disciples in Mark chapter 1 verse 17. Follow me. That simple, powerful call changed Sagar's life forever. Sagar gathered with other Christians, worshipped and prayed. It was always risky, but as Sagar says, fellowship is essential for growth. Eventually, Sagar decided to take the most dangerous job in the church, the pastor. One day, the secret police raided the house church meeting, but Sagar was prepared. Increasingly, Iranian Christians meet to share advice and knowledge on how to withstand persecution from secret police including both practical and spiritual tips. Three days later, Sagar was at the airport. She knew that at any moment she could be intercepted by the secret police, but God reminded her of a verse from Isaiah 43. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned. She walked through the airport and onto the plane and is now living in another country. Thanks to being prepared and to God's intervention, Sakhar managed to get out of Iran. With that story in our minds, we now consider the passage that Rebecca has just read for us. But firstly, it is helpful to look back to chapter 17. Paul has been in Athens, where he was met with ridicule and scant response, which may have been more difficult than the open opposition that he had experienced in Thessalonica and Berea. Although some people believed, he decided to leave Athens and travelled alone the 50 miles to Corinth. Paul was a travelling man, moving from one city to another, 
spreading the good news of Jesus both to Jews and Gentiles. At that time, Corinth was the political and commercial centre of Greece, surpassing Athens in importance. It was a city with a reputation for great wickedness and immorality. But Paul was ready to face the challenge and recognise the great ministry opportunity. All Jewish boys were taught a trade, and Paul's was as a tent maker, using tools that he was easily able to take from place to place, thus enabling him to earn a living and to travel to the places where God was leading him. In Corinth he found Aquila and Priscilla, a married couple with whom he had a lot in common. The three of them shared a culture, as they were all Jews, a faith in the Lord Jesus, and a trade making tents. A strong friendship developed, enabling them to support one another, which is clear when Paul later writes that Priscilla and Aquila risked their lives for me. Romans 16 verse 4. Whilst Paul is working at his trade, he takes the opportunity to speak in the synagogue each Sabbath, trying to change the thinking of both Jews and Gentiles. When Silas and Timothy arrive, Paul is able to use all his time to speak of Jesus, possibly because they were now able to support him financially, either by working themselves or because they brought a financial gift from the church in Thessalonica. With this increased time to teach, though, came greater opposition from the Jews, so much so that Paul says that he has done all that he can for them and he will now share the message with the Gentiles. Paul didn't move far, though, from the synagogue. In fact, we read he went next door, from a very public place to a private house where Titius Justus, a believer, lived. Here we can see that he was able to successfully preach the message about Jesus. And subsequently, Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his whole household were baptised. Many more Corinthians were then converted. And so Paul's decision to move from Jewish to Gentile evangelism seems to have been justified. When Paul had success in other towns and cities, with people believing the message he preached, opposition had forced him to leave. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 3, Paul writes, I came to you in weakness and fear, and with much trembling. We may perceive Paul to be a strong man, ready to share God's message whatever the circumstances. However, this may not always have been the case. In verses 9 to 10, Jesus appears in a vision to Paul and says, Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in this city. These words must have been a great encouragement to Paul, at a time when he was fearful. They offered assurance that he was in the right place and he had a job to do, and consequently he stayed for a further 18 months. The final section of the passage turns to another attack on Paul's ministry, again instigated by Jews. Paul is brought before Roman proconsul Gallio and charged with promoting a religion not approved by Roman law. However, Gallio was not interested in the charge and told the Jews that they should settle the matter themselves. This was not only an encouragement for Paul, but it was a great victory for Christianity, because a ruling like this by a Roman official was equivalent to endorsing Christianity as a permissible religion. So, what could we learn from these verses today, and how are they still relevant to our situation, and indeed those for whom faith in Christ is dangerous? Firstly, the importance of other people stands out in this passage. Priscilla, Aquila and Paul formed a special partnership which enabled them to work and worship together. At St Peter's, home groups are an important part of our Christian community. Although each group may start out as quite a diverse set of people from different backgrounds, having different jobs, etc. As the relationships develop over time, areas of commonality are often found. There is support for one another through good times and bad, in prayer and fellowship. In the persecuted church, the same is true, with small groups meeting, often in secret, verbally sharing their stories and sections of the Bible which they have learned by heart 
because it is too dangerous to carry a Bible. There's a challenge for us. When Paul preached, people responded in different ways to him. There were those who were abusive to him, men such as Crispus who believed in his message of good news, and Gallio who was apathetic and not interested in what Paul had to say. When that same message of God's saving grace is shared today, the same three attitudes can be expected. Abuse, apathy or acceptance. If we expect to receive the first two responses, we might miss the opportunity to tell others and provide them with a chance to change their lives. We must speak the message, but we are not responsible for how people will respond. Secondly, Paul's response to what God said to him can also be reflected in our lives. The words, do not be afraid, for I am with you, must surely provide comfort and strength to each one of us in times of difficulty. Paul heard God's words of assurance, believed and trusted him, then got on with the task he had been given. Today, there are many Christians who seek God's reassurance as they spread his message to people across the world. Finally, although the Lord was with Paul, he did not promise him that he would not be harmed or face further difficult situations. Being a Christian is not an easy path to follow and there will be difficulties along the way. However, we must be confident that God is in control and this will enable us to face the challenges that occur. This must be extremely hard though, for those who live in countries where to have a Christian faith brings great danger. From this passage in Acts and the story from Saghar, we can see that Jesus protects those who share his good news. We may not face persecution, but when asked what Christians can do for Iranian believers, Saghar immediately knows the answer. Pray. No Christian should face persecution unprepared and no Christian should go through it without prayer from the worldwide church. With those words in our minds, let us pray. Heavenly Father, we pray that the Lord would give increased strength and faith to our brothers and sisters facing difficult choices. Let us lift them up as they suffer for the sake of Christ. We ask that you will fill them with courage in every circumstance as they choose the life of Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. Let's all pray together. O loving and powerful Father, we praise you this morning for your unfailing love. We thank you for your overwhelming goodness and mercy. We worship you with our hearts, our minds, our souls and our bodies. We come before you in wonder and awe at all the amazing things you have done. And we glorify you for sending your one and only Son, Jesus, to be our Saviour our protector and our friend. May we honour you with our lives in all we do, in thought and word and deed. Grant us today the same boldness as those of old to proclaim your name to those we meet, to share with them the good news of Jesus and of his transforming power. Grant us the courage to stand up for you in all situations and circumstances. In your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. Loving Lord, we bring before you today our local community. Thank you, Father, for those young and old who make up our neighbourhood. Have your hand upon all those who care and educate our local children, those who are in care homes and those who care for them. Grant wisdom to those in positions of authority that good decisions might be made. Be close, we pray, to those members of our community who are downhearted at this time. Grant healing and peace to those who are sick and for those grieving for lost loved ones. We pray that your word might be shared with our local families and that your love might strengthen family bonds of love and of hope. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Lord Jesus, as we move towards a time of fewer COVID restrictions, we ask that you would grant guidance to our government. As they assess data and make judgments about how to open up our society once again. We thank you for the vaccine programme and we pray that it might continue to go smoothly. 
We pray for those nations still in the midst of turmoil as they struggle to get the virus under control. And we ask for deliverance from this terrible disease. In your name we pray these things. Amen. Amen. And now let's join our prayers together in the prayer that our Father taught us, the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, through your Holy Spirit, inspire our commitment to gather together as the body of Christ. Help us not to be apathetic about our freedom to meet, to praise your name, to hear your word, and to bring our prayers to you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Eternal Father, we thank you for feeding us with your word and your spirit. Build us up in hope and grow us in self-giving love, not for our own material comfort, but for the glory of Jesus, our Lord and Saviour. In his name we pray. Amen. May God, the Holy Trinity, make us strong in faith and love. Unite us in faith and truth. 
and defend us on every side to faithfully do your will. And may the blessing of God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen.